All right, good morning, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm very happy today to introduce Dr. Joel Paris for Grand Rounds. Um, Dr. Paris is on faculty with the McGill Psychiatry Department and has been since 1972. Um, he's been a full professor since 1994 and was appointed Emeritus Professor in 2018. Um, he also served as the department chair for 10 years. Um, he's a research associate at the SMBD Jewish General Hospital and heads personality clinics at the Jewish General Hospital and McGill University Health Center. He's also done a lot in terms of academic, um, academics and research. Um, he was editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry. Um, he is a prolific educator who has supervised psychiatric evaluation with residents for over 40 years and has won many awards for his teaching. He's a um, writer who has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles and is author of 22 books and 50 book chapters. Dr. Paris's research interest is in borderline personality disorder, and today he'll be talking about the current understanding of suicide and BPD. Um, on a personal note, it brings me great honor to introduce Dr. Paris, as his writings have helped me immensely throughout my training to understand and demystify BPD. I began residency, as I suspect many people in this room did, with a, a very rudimentary understanding of BPD. Um, I understood it primarily through a lot of stereotypes and myths that have been propagated in our field, things that BP things like the idea that BPD is unchangeable, untreatable, that patients with this disorder are hateful or manipulative, or that we shouldn't tell our patients about their disorder or consider even avoiding the diagnosis entirely. Um, however, what I saw in my um, be beginning clinical practice didn't always resonate with this narrative, so I tried to look at the literature and gain a deeper understanding of this disorder. And in doing so, over and over, I noticed that the articles that brought the most light to my understanding of this disorder were written by Dr. Paris. Um, so throughout this writing, it became clear that he not only understood the condition, but cared deeply about making sure that other people understood it as well. And I have no doubt that today's talk will help everyone here to gain a deeper understanding. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Paris. Thank you very much for a heartwarming introduction. That's what I've worked for all my life. Um, so, and thank you for inviting me to this beautiful UCLA campus with beautiful weather, which we don't have this time of year in Canada. So uh, I don't have any real conflict of interest. Some people list their books as a conflict of interest because they might make a little money if people buy them. I have a, a, la a larger book on the treatment of BBD that's come out this month from Guilford. But if you, there's a shorter book about half the length, which I um, published a couple of years ago, and you can get it for free if you just email me, uh, because I have an electronic copies, and uh, so anybody who wants to have more detail, it's there. So um, suicide. Well, I'm interested in suicidal patients. Uh, I feel. Uh, it justifies my medical training uh, in psychiatry. Uh, even if I'm not writing that many prescriptions, I'm treating a population which is chronically suicidal. And these patients, it's interesting, even PhD psychologists, many of them and other mental health professionals, are scared of chronically suicidal people. And there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, we are also scared, but uh, we're all, but doctors are used to the fact that some of their patients do die. And so if you haven't had a suicide in your practice, practice and you've been around for a while, I would ask what kind of patients you're treating exactly because this is a, this is a big deal and, and a unique role for psychiatry. So, uh, and, and, and of course, a real challenge. And of course, it is frightening. We don't want to lose our patients. We care about them quite often, usually. I rather like these patients. Uh, uh, they're kind of colorful. They, act, they get me up in the morning. Uh, and in my own nerdish disposition, uh, I, get, I, get, I get to see a different world than the one I live in. Uh, but people are afraid of being sued. And I, I think it's pretty well known that that's more common in the United States than Canada for many historical reasons, which I won't go into, but Canadians tend to be respect, more respectful of authority. 
and less punitive when things go wrong. So I think that's a bigger problem here, but you can't, it's like driving defensively. You can't get around the city if you're always thinking, you know, about crashing. You have to, you have to get where you're going. What I discovered um, was that the idea of suicide prevention is kind of a myth. Uh, there's really not much evidence for it. Uh, most deaths by suicide occur in men who hang and shoot themselves in their very first attempt. And haven't been, most of them have not been in psychiatric treatment. They may have seen a doctor. Um, and we don't know the inpatient or out or outpatient treatment actually reduces suicide rates. We don't know that admitting patients when they're suicidal actually prevents them from committing suicide. There's no evidence for that. Uh, and uh, where, where the suicide prevention, I think, relates perhaps to population level interventions that I'll come to in a minute. So, for example, oh, another thing is suicide hotlines or diaries analyzed by artificial intelligence. Thomas Insel gave us a talk uh, a, couple, a year or two ago, and he talked about his idea of, of uh, having an AI that read everyone's diaries and would somehow be able to predict whether they commit suicide. But this is just something he's, he's doing as a business, and I don't think there's any evidence for it. Um, maybe barriers on bridges, gun control, putting small numbers of pills in a package when the pharmacy hands them out, these things may have some effect on suicide. But psychiatrists and mental health professionals are not very good at preventing suicide. And that's okay because uh, we, we have other things to deal with with patients. Going back many years, uh, in Iowa there was a study by Goldstein et al., 1991, and a very similar one in Pennsylvania uh, by Picorni et al. And what they did was they took a large number of patients who had been admitted to ho ho state hospitals for suicidality, and they, and they applied common algorithms that are taught to psychiatrists and residents and people like that to predict who would be most likely to commit suicide. Uh, these guidelines are not evidence-based, and yet they're still taught so what happened, uh, what happened was that they didn't predict a single case of, of completed suicide. Uh, and I think that, that goes with the territory. So I w maybe relax is putting it too strongly, but uh, you, you, should, you could worry about patients, but don't panic. And if somebody does, some of your patients, very few will commit suicide. I mean, the programs I've been running for the last, since 2001, I think we've, we've had maybe four or five suicides with, out of a thousand patients. So it's not that this is very common. Most of the people who commit suicide are not in treatment. Uh, and the ones who are in treatment are, are less at risk because they're help seeking. So your role is not to prevent suicide, but to treat the suffering that makes people want to escape the world and makes them suicidal. And as one, uh, Harvard psychiatrist pointed out many years ago, calculated risk may sometimes be necessary. So Insel, in that same lecture that he gave, said that, he, that in 15 years as director of NIMH, he failed to lower the suicide rate for the American population. Uh, I thought he was dreaming. Uh, we don't know the reasons why suicide rates go up and down. It's gone up in the last 10 years after being stable for quite a while. And so what, what's this all about? Is it about, we have more psychiatrists and more suicides? I mean, what exactly is this relationship? So probably the best theory goes back to the sociologist, Emil Durkheim, who over a hundred years ago wrote a book on suicide and he described suicide as being related to anomie. And, and this is related to social forces and loss of social cohesion. And there's all, kind, all kinds of things that, that, that affect suicide. Which, which perhaps are not quite in the purvey of psychiatry. Okay, how does all this apply to BPD? The key feature of the disorder is emotion dysregulation. This is the feature which is most specific in, in for diagnosis. It's also the one that lasts the longest and doesn't go away even after people stop cutting themselves and taking overdoses. 
and it's associated with chronic suicidality because when they, people get upset, they have this wish to escape. So this can take the form of overdoses, cutting, also substance use and eating disorder. And of course, as you know, their relationships are conflictual, unstable, and overly dependent. So why is it important to recognize BPD? Well, it's, it's particularly, it's even more important now that we have good treatment for it, which we didn't have before. It used to be, there was kind of like nothing, or giving patients long-term open-ended psychoanalytic therapy, which we now know is not effective. And, we, and until Marshall Linehan came along and published her book in 1993, and then other people have developed, I think, parallel methods since then, um, we now have effective treatment for most of these patients if we could get, get them access to it. And I'll come back to that later. Um, so about 9% of outpatients, this is Zimmerman's big sample in Rhode Island where he, he's, he's published hundreds of papers without a single grant because he, he just incorporates research into his evaluation procedure at the Rhode Island Hospital in Providence. So 9% of these patients had BPD in the outpatient. And in the community, there have been different numbers put, put out there, but I think 1% to 2% is the most consistent. That's still a lot of people. That's slightly higher than schizophrenia. So there's a lot of people suffering from this. And many of them are adolescents. And uh, some people say you, don't, you shouldn't diagnose personality disorder before age 18. That's not what the DSM says. People haven't read it very carefully. You're not supposed to diagnose antisocial personality disorder because you call it conduct disorder till age 18. And then they graduate if they still have the same symptoms. But other personality disorders, if they have had the symptoms for at least a year, fairly continuously, you can make this diagnosis. And in fact, a lot of the, this is the disorder which begins in adolescence. So you do people a disservice if you don't make the diagnosis in adolescence because they're often pumped full of antidepressants which don't work very well in this population and in fact need something rather different, which is specialized psychotherapy. Ordinary psychotherapy doesn't work, I can tell you. And also, you know, people have to, have a structure which is effective. So a lot of uh, patients I s tell me, oh, I want to see a psychologist. So what happened? Well, I went in every week and I, and I told about my week and, and it was all very sympathetic. Then, and then she said, goodbye, see you next week. Uh, I hear these stories which don't involve the kind of structured interventions related to the disorder that we now notice, notice that are working. Come, now, what about suicidality? Well, I'd just like to point out that suicidal ideation is extremely common lifetime. 15% in the National Comorbidity Survey uh, done most recently about 15 years ago. So a lot of people will think about suicide. I think it might be even higher than 15% because people will forget, you know, the last time they were depressed, uh, and maybe rightly so. Um, Suicide attempts, though, of any kind, are about four, about five percent in the same survey. So, uh, uh, but death by suicide is, in fact, is quite rare: twenty-two to one hundred thousand in men, and less than that in women. So you can't predict rare outcomes from common symptoms. And so, admitting somebody for because they're thinking about suicide to me is not logical because because you have this enormous number of people who, when they're upset, are going to think about suicide, but they need treatment. They don't need to be put on a ward for a few days, although everybody does it, particularly in the emergency room, where you don't know what the follow-up is going to be. So borderline personality disorder is important to recognize, but it is often misdiagnosed, uh, often as depression, because the people confuse instability of mood with, uh, with, de with depressive episodes. They can have depressive episodes, but that only proves that the DSM definition of a major depressive episode is too broad. I mean, two weeks of five symptoms and you've got it. <laughs> so some, some studies suggest that lifetime, half of us might have a major depressive episode. So I, I find this is a problematic definition, um, especially given the fact that that only 40 to 50 percent of patients respond to, to antidepressants. And the other one, of course, is bipolar disorder. This is a big fad for bipolar disorder. 
Um, anyone with mood swings, some people, if they're not familiar with, with other concepts related to personality and responses to interpersonal problems, they will say, oh, mood swings, knee jerk, anti, uh, bipolar disorder. And of course, it's been shown that these drugs don't work either. Lithium doesn't work. And there was a big trial of lamotrigine that was published in the American Journal just last year from the UK. Really, really well done. And what was the result? Zero. By the way, these drugs are still being prescribed anyway. Uh, the comorbidities that we have to think about are the ones, again, in the way of treatment. So if somebody has such a degree of substance abuse that they can't come in clean, even, even, even to, be, to talk to a therapist, you have to treat the substance abuse first. And similarly, very heavy-duty eating disorders, life-threatening anorexia or bulimia that goes on all day, every day, these things often need to be treated first. Other than that, there's no reason to treat depression in borderline personality disorder in the same way as we treat it in people who don't have personality disorders. It just, it's just not necessary, and it's not effective. And the literature is absolutely clear about this, but I never see a patient who isn't on, anti, on antidepressants by the time they come to me anyway. Now, this turns out to be a disorder with a pretty good prognosis. Surprisingly, this really surprised people because, and the reason why it's a surprise is because of something which Cohen and Cohen wrote an article about in archives in 1982 called The Clinician's Illusion. What is The Clinician's Illusion? The Clinician's Illusion is that you think that, that people don't get better because the patients that keep coming back are not getting better. But all the ones who got better stop coming back. So if you actually do service, longitudinal follow-up of these patients in the and, and go back to the community and see what happened to them, the vast majority of them improve. So uh, now we did a study uh, in Montreal where we followed them for 27 years. Uh, Mary Zanarini has, I think, the most sophisticated study uh, with uh, uh, at the McLean Hospital uh, near Boston. And she's now been, followed those patients for 24 years. And that's a prospective study rather than a retrospective study. So that has all kinds of advantages. The one disadvantage is the patients were all admitted to a mental hospital. So they're, they're somewhat sicker than the patients you may see just in an outpatient setting who have only been maybe to ER a few times. So this is actually a good prognosis condition. Much why would you want to have bipolar disorder, which has had so much a worse prognosis when borderline personality disorder has a better one and can be more and be successfully treated? Probably because people don't believe in psychotherapy anymore, and if it doesn't respond to medication, forget about it. But in fact, uh, dialectical behavior therapy has the best has the the, the best evidence, and uh, uh, there are. There are other methods, which I don't think are that different from DBT, but they have different acronyms. People have talked about acronym-based psychotherapy instead of, instead of evidence-based psychotherapy. Um, so we have mentalization-based therapy, which is done here in UCLA by Dr. Kissel. Um, it was developed in London, England by uh, uh, Anthony Bateman. We have transference-focused psychotherapy which I don't fully understand, but there are trials supporting it. It was developed in New York by a group of people who originally were, were students of Otto Kernberg. STEPS uh, is a treatment which has been developed for people, which interests me in particular because it was developed in Iowa for people who are out in rural areas where there are no psychiatrists and where there isn't much, much other forms of treatment and it's brief. And so uh, this also has some uh, good clinical trials behind it. And most recently, the late John Gunderson developed something uh, called general psychiatric management, which is kind of a once-a-week office-based practice uh, to treat these patients. Now, in the research, you usually compare your treatment to treatment as usual. and But even treatment as usual can lead to improvement. As, as it does in so many areas of medicine and psychiatry. There's a meta-analysis recently by Finch et al., which found a pretty good effect size 
for treatment as usual in BPD. So even if you're not doing the specialized work, you may still be helping patients. But I think it's better to, to include some of these ideas. Now, how many of these patients actually do commit suicide in the end? Well, in Zanarini's sample, it was 7%. In ours, it was 10%. Uh, there are a few, uh, and I think that's sort of the range uh, that you see. So what this means is that even though these patients have been threatening to commit suicide, or even standing at your doorway as they leave and saying, you won't see me again, doctor, because I'll be dead by next week. You know, they, they have a, do have a way of getting to us. Um, nevertheless, over 90% of them do not commit suicide in the end. That's the good news. Now, a 10% suicide rate is not to be, not to be sneezed at, but uh, we have similar rates in schizophrenia and probably higher rates of bipolar disorder even. So um, the one thing that isn't so generally known is a 10% of them, an additional 10% on top of the suicide die relatively young. And BPD or any severe personality disorder or any severe mental disorder for that matter reduces the lifespan by at least a decade. And this is also because they're, they don't take care of themselves, they uh, they use substances. They don't eat properly. Uh, they develop they de develop all kinds of complications of medical illness. So when do they commit suicide? Well, we had the most interesting finding that we had in our study that was published twenty years ago uh, of a, was that the mean age of death was tw at death was thirty seven point three. Now think about that because. The patients who come to the emergency room are not usually 37 years old. They're usually between 18 and 18 and 30. Uh, and, and maybe there's even a bulge at the, at the lower end of, of the ages. Uh, but, but in our follow-up, only one person actually committed suicide before age 30. So what does this mean? It means that uh, when you have a young person who's quotes, acting out a lot and is doing a lot of self-harm behaviors. This is not the, the person you have to worry the most about they're committing suicide. It's rather the person who fails to recover because most people, and I tell the patients this, you mentioned uh, uh, in your introduction that, uh, that people didn't use to tell the diagnosis. I routinely tell them the diagnosis and I tell them which websites to look it up and read about it, which, which by now everyone has already done by the time they get to me. Uh, um, and uh, so the, the, I tell them that, that they're likely to recover. The treatment may, may, go this, may go faster. But of those who fail to respond to treatment or don't stay in treatment and continue to have a miserable life, these are the people who are most likely to commit suicide. And it happens at, at, at a later point in their development. Can we predict this? Uh, not very well. In study done in Montreal, also in San Diego, of youth suicides with BPD, most, the vast majority of patients were not in treatment when they commit suicide. So again, if the patient is coming to see you, the suicide rate doesn't disappear entirely, but it's, it's going to be less than somebody out there that you're not seeing. Now, people who, rep who are repetitive attempters often have BPD. These, People are well known in emergency rooms. They're not generally liked, and this was also mentioned in the introduction. You can understand why. I remember doctors saying, I'm trying to get people well, and you're trying to get make yourself, and you're cutting yourself up to be sicker. So they people were frustrated by this because they don't really understand it as to why they do it. But I mean, self-harm is a way of emotion regulation. Every patient will tell you, the moment I cut myself, I feel better. So it's addictive. Um of these attempters in a big study in, in the UK by Horton, 3% of attempters eventually did die by suicide, and yet 97% did not. So again, most people who, was, who come into a suicide attempts are not at very high risk for suicide, but there is some risk. So borderline patients are most suicidal in their 20s, but that's not the time at which they're most likely to die. Most of them can be expected to recover at least partially by age 30. Now, in our follow-up, we found that uh, 
almost none of them, we followed them up to page age 50 and almost none of them are, met the criteria of the BPD anymore at, at age 50. Now, some of them still had problems. Zanarini has talked about this. It's a bit like your negative symptoms and psychosis. There are things which stay around even when more active and dramatic symptoms go away. Nevertheless, uh, we in, in our sample, uh, we found that uh, a lot of these patients were working and had jobs, most of them. That's a, it was a little bit different in, uh, the, in Zanarini's so, sample. Um, and uh, interesting, about only half of them were living with somebody. About, and the rest of them were living by themselves, and only half of them ever had children. So this is a dramatic difference from the general population. However, if you, if you develop a career and have a job and feel and a social network and you feel valued in other ways, you don't need necessarily to get to have a partner and have children. And this is, is indeed, it isn't the only way uh, to to recover. So, uh, and this is something we, we we built into our own program, which is to say, uh, part of the treatment is going is going to work or going to school in order to prepare to go to work, and 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 this is and if you don't do that and you just collect a welfare check, you probably won't get that much benefit out of our, out of our uh, treatment. Okay, so. If we can't predict suicide and we can't prevent it, uh, we, we have to tolerate what it feels like to have someone who suffers enough to, to, to think about suicide for years and years and years. And this is a, a book I uh, published 15 years ago called Half in Love with Death, which was about people who are chronically suicidal. And what's that experience? Why are you half in love with death? Because you feel you could always, the exit door is open. And in fact, and so your suffering is somewhat ameliorated by that fact. So I actually feel that that's a protective factor for many of these patients. They don't have to commit suicide because I know they can if they need to. Now, the nature of suicide attempts at BPD is a little more dramatic than that. They come in with emergency, with emergency room with overdoses. But their motivation is usually ambivalent. And uh, the, in the intent is to, es to communicate something or to escape something, or usually after a quarrel, sometimes right in front of other people, and or rescuers are frequently contacted. Self-harm is different because uh, cutting has become quite endemic in the population. And a lot of teenagers are cutting but researchers, research tells us reassuringly that, t that adolescent uh, self-harmers usually give it up and don't keep on doing it. If they do keep on doing it, they're more, more likely to be on the road for borderline personality disorder or something similar. So I mentioned this repetitive and addictive nature. And uh, this is something which uh, usually not that hard harmful physically, although there are a few patients who will make very deep cuts. Most people make just do those little cuts on the wrist or on the inside of their thighs so nobody can see because it's a bit sad sometimes to see when people have given up cutting, but their arms are completely scarred. So what's going to happen the next time they're in a relationship with somebody? What are, how are they going to explain this? So coming back to why I'm against usually hospital hospitalization for suicidal patients with BPD is that it, the people say, well, we have to provide safety, but how do you know that it's safe without data? And nobody's ever done a randomized controlled trial, nor, nor would anybody permit you to do such a trial to randomly assign people to be admitted or not if they were suicidal. What happens if they're held overnight in the emergency room? What happens if they go upstairs and they stay on a ward is there any treatment that can be carried out that's active in psychosis? There is, because you, you can start the drugs. They may work quite rapidly. But in these patients, we're looking at a suicide watch, which I don't find very impressive. And besides which, uh, the longer the patient stays in the hospital, the greater the danger they are of 
are the, of, of detaching themselves from their social networks. So I think the only good reasons are when they do have psychotic episodes, which they do sometimes for a few days, or life-threatening suicide attempts, which I think probably deserve a careful look. Now, we do know that outpatient interventions are effective. We know this now. They do not require an admission. Uh, we have RCT for several methods uh, of specialized psychotherapy. And the problem, as I, well, I'll come to in a minute, is one of access. So I uh, was able to, 15 years ago, to convince hospital uh, administrators that if we had a program for these patients and which would provide a rapid access to outpatient therapy, they would come less to the emergency and the emergency room could, could take a breather because I don't know what it's like here, but our emergency rooms are packed with all kinds of, of people. Um, and since, and since uh, repeated hospitalizations uh, to me are very regressive. Here is a, a quote from a, 20 years ago, a patient wrote an article about her own experience. When you are a service provider, do not give ex expected response to suicidal threats. You'll be accused of not caring. I'm sure those of us who work with that population have heard that a lot. Um, what you're really doing is being cruel to be kind. That's Hamlet. Um, when my doctor would hospitalize him, I accused of not, him of not caring. And he replied, referring to my repeated hospitalizations, that's not life. And he was right. So do not hospitalize a person with BPD for more than 48 hours. Uh, one episode leads right to another. What are the alternatives in a, in a dangerous situation? If we could get patients into day treatment more rapidly. Do you have day hospitals here at the uh, UCLA? I thought, okay, great. Um, this is a structure where you get some of the benefits of hospitalization in terms of close watch and, and close and detailed workup without the regression of how that hospitals tend to tend to promote and you get people activated and there have been a couple of problem with day treatment is there's usually a wait, a wait list for it but you may go to a crisis clinic and then to a day hospital so what about the danger of, of being sued well suicide accounts for 20 percent of all loose lawsuits in the usa that's a lot against doctors of course of which 20 only 20 percent are upheld so that's a good news Although people who have been through this have told me how traumatic it is. Uh, and often arises from the early dis dis discharge of inpatients, but not necessarily chronically suicidal inpatients. Many studies show that most psychiatrists and clinical psychologists uh, will have a suicide, at least half of them at least will have a suicide somewhere in their practice. So Guttile, who's written a lot about this in Massachusetts, talks about the importance of good record keeping, getting a consultation. And also, many people have talked about meeting with the family. The first time you meet the family, ideally, should not be after the patient is, is dead, but when they're still alive and you explain the plan and you establish an alliance with them and you talk about what you can and cannot do for the patient, but you're going to try to do your best. And since most patients with this condition do not commit suicide and generally recover, uh, and since we can promote emotion regulation, reduce impulsivity, and improve relationships with our th current therapies, it's actually not such a, such a dismal pro prospect. Now, the last part of the talk, and I want to leave uh, 15 minutes for, for discussion and questions. The last part of the talk is something which troubles me quite deeply, and, it, and it's everywhere. So uh, what's the use of having effective treatments if nobody can access them. If they last too long, if they cost too much, if, if they're not offered. Um, in Montreal, we have the most, now, uh, now we have the most available uh, treatments, both on the English and the French sides of, of our divide for BPD. Uh, but that's not true in the rest of Canada. I'm not sure, not sure it's not true in most places in the United States. And even when programs are properly insured, there's long waiting lists. So 
Shelly McMain from Toronto has talked about the need to shorten and streamline treatment. So she did a study, I just, which is unpublished, but uh, she presented it at a conference we had in Vancouver a few months ago, which she randomly assigned patients with DBT to six months and 12 months of treatment. That's, 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 that was the study. So what do you think she found? No difference. So she was able to, so the conclusion is there's no reason you'd have need to have a year of DBT if you can get the same result in six months. We've taken that a step further. And we use something, now we are not promoting this for everybody, but for most, most BPD patients. And we call it a step care model. You may be familiar with it. It refers to situations in medicine where, you, where most people uh, that you see with a certain condition will have a, may ha have a relatively good prognosis and only a minority, a bad prognosis, and you can give less intensive treatment to most people and reserve the heavy duty treatment for those who fail that step. So what we've been doing since 2001 is uh, we give 11 week, 12 weeks of group and individual therapy. And we see about uh, 100 patients, we treat about 100 patients a year with that package. And it's amazing when we come to the end of, the, of this period and 80 to 90% of the patients are much better. And, and of course we have some very talented people working on our team, but also uh, the patients are, 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 are committed to the treatment and they're, they're in a structured setting which gives them a kind of safety net of a different kind. We do reserve longer treatment for chronic cases or for those who fail the first step. So of those 100 patients a year, 12% of them will come back and ask for more treatment and say that they relapsed or continuing to have serious problems. Um, but what that also means, 88% of these patients do not. Now, are they going other places? I don't think so because we're so well known in the city that, that when they hear that they've been to us, they, uh, they're, they're shipped back very quickly. Um, so I think this is probably accurate. So, over, so that the vast majority of patients don't come back. And they're also patients who are, tend to be older, are collecting welfare, having worked for years, have a poor social network, who we don't expect to get, we'll be able to help them in a short time, but our approach to them is sort of more rehabilitative. So they go into this longer program, which we've also shortened because we started it as two years, and we discovered that wasn't necessary, and now we're giving a maximum of one year. And we've had very few suicides. And we published a paper two years ago my colleague, Lee's Laporte, uh, analyzed this data. It was in the personality and mental health. And, uh, and we were able to, to show, I mean, we didn't have a control group, but we were able to show in an effectiveness study that most of these patients did get better. Now this, I don't think long-term therapy is routinely indicated for BPD. Nobody's conducted an RCT lasting more than a year. And uh, a lot of evidence that shorter treatment can also be affected and a lot of reasons not to, not to offer it because of all the problems it creates. So how, in summary, the management of suicidality depends on your understanding of chronic of suicidality, not just as I'm gonna kill myself, but as a communication of distress. They wanna make sure you hear them and, and they may have to raise the volume a bit to make sure you're listening. We have adapted DBT skills to manage emotion, to help patients manage emotion regulation, and we're treating the patient and not the threat. So this is our philosophy. Uh, and uh, we want them to get out there, behaviorally activate, do things, pr prepare themselves. For, for a lot, most of our patients are on the young side, and it's still not too late for them to prepare themselves for to go back to school or to get themselves a better job. And we put a lot of emphasis on that. Don't try to solve your problem with a relationship. You need to have an identity of your own. So there is a so while there is a risk for death 
of suic by suicide of these patients. It's low compared to attempts at ideation, neither of which are very predictive of, of a fatal outcome, and there's no evidence that hospitalization prevents it. What's needed is more than a hospital stay is an empathic response and an understanding person. Even in an emergency room, I think there's something to gain from sitting down and talking to these patients and understanding them. Understanding why they need to think about suicide and not overreacting. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Paris. Time for some questions. See a hand up. Hi, thanks so much for that interesting talk. I was just curious with your stepped care model, um, 12 weeks to go through all the DBT skills, are you cutting some out? Are you going at a pretty aggressive pace with that or how are you managing to fit that all in? There's a lot of skills in the book and and e even 12 months, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to do everything. Uh, we are, we are definitely picking and choosing and we are, uh, what, 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 what we're looking at basically is um, what happens to you when you're upset? How do you go out of whack? How soon, how soon can you catch yourself? Can you learn to observe yourself um, before, before you, you, you carry out some impulsive action? Um, what else can you do to, pre to prevent this cycle from being out of control? You know, this is, it's similar to what Anthony Bateman says about MBT, which is he says, once you've lost your mentalization, forget about it. You know, we're not going to listen to anything. So you've got to, so these skills are used by patients and clearly Marshall, we're not following Marshall in hand by the book. We're adapting it for a different purpose. I was wondering how your groups run. Do you have specific structures for the groups? Yes, so we have, yes, uh, the, the groups uh, focus on a different major topic each of the 11 weeks, and there's some didactic material that's presented, but it quickly moves to give us examples and let's talk about it. It's not so much group process as it is, as it is using, using the examples from the group as a as ways of teaching something and how it, and that can be applied by other people, other members. I was curious about um, in implementing uh, targeted therapies like DBT, MBT, or, or transference-focused uh, therapy, if uh, if you're actually um, sort of speeding the remission. Um, in terms of not meeting criteria anymore versus um, just helping to build coping with the sort of illness that persists along whatever course it's going to? Yeah, well, our, it's a good question. Uh, what Some of these patients are absolutely asymptomatic after treatment, uh, or, uh, particularly as they get older. Um, where there's a sort of a naturalistic level of, level of recovery, they may they may still be a little bit thin-skinned and get upset with what, more than the average person when when things happen, but but there's certainly a, a group like that. Pro, I think for most of them, they're getting by in life. They have a job. They may have they may not have a good relationship, but a lot of them do. Um, and I don't think living with an illness is the right way of looking at it, uh, because it implies that, it's that you have an incurable condition. BPD is, is a condition, which, a, di a disorder which begins in adolescence and, and really affects you for quite a number of years over the course of your 20s, and then that gets better. It's not always completely better, but in most cases, these patients are no longer seeing psychiatrists or other therapists uh, later on in their lives. So that's not the same thing as living, as living with bipolarity or living with psychosis. 
I, I, I think it has to be seen as an exaggerated problem with certain stages of life that most people find difficult in one way or another. Other questions? I'm still here. <laughs> if you want to pick my brains. Yeah. Well, if anybody does have questions um, that you'd prefer to ask one-on-one, -on -one, feel free to come up after the talk. And thank you all for being here. And thanks again, Dr. Ferris. <laughs>